everybody. Welcome back to Tibet Knots. I'm John. I'm standing in front of the Meredith Museum in Newport News, Virginia. Well, yes. I mean, one of the major things that's been taking my time in the last few few weeks really is processing the items from my museum to go down to Chatham Historic Dockyard. So, um, so tell me about that. I mean, that's going to be a major interest to everyone concerned because, uh, I mean, Lindsay and I have been talking about museums. I mean, you're the only one that has a not in museum in the world. Well, and it goes back a long way, really. And I think perhaps we could almost go back to the beginning of the reason for the founding of the International Guild of Knot Ties, okay. really, which is to make um, the world treat the world of knots more seriously. So from day one, that, that, that was sort of one of the major aims. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you're, I'm not sure that oh, how many of your um, uh, viewers will, will appreciate that. Uh, I mean, it goes right back to the article on the front page of the Times, which uh, about Hunter's Bend, which in itself then gave um, a degree of seriousness to this new knot, which went round the world, which then, if you like to say, flushed out um, people interested in the world of knots. Um, I mean, I had a phone call from a friend of mine. Hey, Des, have you seen this on the front page of the Times? You must know all about this. <laughs> well, I didn't, but I made contact pretty soon and smartish with Geoffrey Budworth and having met him, uh, we had so many interests in, in common. We were interested in books uh, on the world of knots and sailors rope work across the spectrum. We were interested in the tools used by, by the, the rope and canvas working trades. And then um, we, we, we were also you know, practitioners. Um, he more so perhaps in the world of macrame, but only just, I suppose. And so, um, it was so good just to meet up with him that we yeah. said, well, why don't we do something like this um, you know, in a bigger way, in a back, back of a pub? And after all, my father belongs to the Letterbox Study Group. Now, if, a, if there can be a group of people interested, don't forget, this is when we say Letterbox Study Group, we're not talking about when there are groups online. And this is way, way, way back, you see, you know, right. 1980s kind of time, um, that early 80s one yeah late late 79 i think it was um you know, if my dad can belong to a group of people that are interested in that surely there should be a group interested in knots when there wasn't um so jeffrey and i then sort of said well let's try and see what we can do he had um a whole load of correspondence that had come to him and i had been collecting for some years um, people's names and addresses where I'd been demonstrating at festivals and things that showed some kind of interest, you yeah. know, and if you, would you be interested in meeting other knot ties, let me have your name and address. And if something happens, I'll let you know. Well, something happened and mm -hmm. the rest is history really. So back in 82, um, we, I found a venue, the, um, Royal, um, research, uh, ship discovery, uh, that was currently, at St. Catherine's Dock as part of the Maritime Trust, as was then um, collection of historic vessels. And we met on there and from there we grew and from where we grew. Um, and 
I'd been collecting for, for, for a long time uh, tools, as I say, and, and examples of rope work where I could find them, old rope work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in 95, 1995, Liz and I had um, what we, they call a, a building society windfall, the building society, which was a mutual um, it, it operation. We it went to be a private sort of bank kind of system and they effectively gave you a bonus to give up your mutuality um, and with that bonus I went to the the people who have built my rope store um, for me and said you've never built a museum but build me a museum and this is what I want and so I had um, oh, uh, a, a, a custom built building for a museum I mean it it's it could be designed de uh, designated a, a a large shed or a small barn but either way um you know it was it was specific for that we we fitted it out and then in 96 uh we opened it with a big sort of weekend um of, of celebrations inviting and this comes back to your comment about uh, museums and i heard you talking with, with um <laughs> Lindsay a little bit about the fact that museums don't really value this field and that was, you know, my um, beef, really. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, uh, I'm a man to uh, sort of put my money where my mouth is. And luckily, Liz also quite prepared to go along with that. So that um, we we had the building built, and we opened, and that meant that um, we I invited all the people in the muse in the museum world that I had sort of had any kind of contact or dealings with, um, which. Uh, was quite gratifying because if you I, I, I'm careful to say this because it's not totally the the, the, the the full story but back 30 years ago there were such things as uh, full-time maritime curators who were maritime curators born and bred whereas today's museum world is really you have to be a generalist um, and there are very few um, truly maritime men or women who are in um, the position of being uh, curators at a museum. Yeah. They, you know, they have to move from one, they, so they might be one, one year, they might be the curator of, of a hat museum in Luton where they, the special, you know, that was their local industry. <laughs> and then they might move to a, a motorcycle museum or a, a local museum that's very, very general and then move up again. Um, and, and so the, 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 the long-term knowledge, the in-depth knowledge is, is, not, um, is not there really. It's, it's a job that they do, it's not yeah. a calling. It's, you know, um, it's interesting to me, and you just, you're talking about that, curators and the specific uh, specialties, specialty areas, the UK, at large is better than better at that than most anyone else as far as I mean in many things medicine and so forth specialists on particular things unfortunate that what you're telling me is that they're more generalists now but having somebody that was focused in laser beam on a particular thing you get much more well and that they've done it for a long long time it's I mean and the truth is John isn't it really that in today's world people don't stick at the same job for a lifetime. So they don't have that in-depth knowledge. They may move from one kind of industry to another kind of industry. Oh yes, I'm an accountant or I'm a manager, but I'm not, you know, I don't know. I mean, I've had men try to sell me rope who before they were selling rope, they were selling rock and roll loudspeakers. <laughs> you know, they don't know anything about rope. I mean, I knew more about rope one of the companies I bought from many years ago now, um, they they were taken they they took they were taken over by a, a bigger company and then they took took over a small a little local braiding company up in the north uh, northwest of, of the UK. They laid everybody off, but they kept the lady that ran the sales office from that little local independent braiding company. Really? She knew her business. Eileen walked around the factory with her eyes open. You know, she, I'd speak to her on the phone and she'd say, 
oh, I do think I saw him up there was still one more spool of that blue that we made that wasn't wasn't quite the right kind of stuff. You know, it was the wrong colour, but we you like it. I think there's another spool up there. I'll go and have a look, you know, but that kind of interest. I mean, they actually had laid her uh, or made her husband redundant because he was one of the works people. Uh -huh. But she was in the sales office. She knew, you know, she knew the product. She knew the whole story. Um, and, you know, that, so that's any part of the world, really. Um, yeah. You, you, you <clears throat> pick it up overnight um, and uh, people coming to me wanting to make a living tying, tying knots. But that's a whole different ballgame. It's not something you can just pick up Des Porsons not uh, not craft uh, and rope mats and go out and make a living yeah but when i started out doing this i knew much of nothing i i uh was I, and i've told Lindsay and i will tell everybody that uh, basically uh, i had finished watching the baseball season and was bored and then covid happened and i had a lot of time on my hands and i had tied knots you know off and on over the years i'd i think i hitched this bottle <laughs> uh in yeah. honor of my dad about 10 or 12 years ago and then uh so I, and i did that just looking it up from ashley's how to do it and um and then i started making paracord bracelets i've discovered you know, on youtube i discovered the um um miko snellman's the, the, the algorithm sends you to other stuff if you look up too yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. i ended up discovering miko and I was like, wow, this guy's using natural line, you know, I'm, how do you find that? And so I put out a search, I tried to find out, I finally found um, Marty Combs, and then he was selling that business to uh, Dan no Noel, who's a, a Coast Guardman. And so that's developed those relationships with those folks. <clears throat> but ultimately, because I joined Miko's Facebook group, one day, a fellow down in, in uh, Florida, uh, named Daryl Inskeep posted a picture of a small Senate frame he had made, and it blew my mind. I was, I'd seen snippets and pictures of them, uh, maybe like the cover of the uh, Ashley's with it had Bernard. Um, um, oh, Bernard Catbush's. Uh, yeah, yeah, Catbush's work. And I was like, really, that's it? just yeah. over the top. But then I decided to make one, and I made that one behind me and posted pictures of it and people would went ooh ah and i was like well that feels good and i want to make them anyway I'm, whether anybody looks at them or not i'm gonna make them and that's kind of progressionally got me to where i am well that's really the same sort of story about bernard cutbush was he made them you know what the hell he i mean he never ever sold them um yeah. and you know, when he when he passed away we had we had quite a problem in sort of sort of finding homes for them all but uh, that's it Look, a number will be finishing up in chatham there's uh, um two i think at the national maritime museum in greenwich i mean they, these are when i say they are there they're not there on public display really um, and it's something that one has to appreciate with museums i mean i've had a lot to do with uh, i was I, I got as far as explaining how i established the museum before we established how i'm now getting rid of it <laughs> um, it, 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 in establishing the museum, the po point was to raise the profile of the world of knots and rope work yeah. and treating it seriously. And so I invited um, curators and things to come. And I had positive letters and I've had visits from people who I say real maritime curators, not just professional curators, but were interested in things maritime. One guy sent an apology. Sorry, I didn't get to your opening weekend because the barge I was sailing on was running late. And I didn't get a chance <laughs> to get up to see you. So that was that was you know that's what he did for his his day off was to go sailing on a sailing barge. Um, so, um, but having established the museum, I then managed uh, very luckily. Um, I, I got the the MBA. I, I'd already yeah. been working with local. I'd been working with local museums and trying to raise their interest in what they have in their collections. And um, uh, there was a, a group called the Maritime Curators Group, which was, again, these professional curators. Um, but th that's what they wanted to do. And they actually set the, the original group up, um, as I understand it, way before my time, um, so that they could go to they could all meet together because they were enthusiasts. You know, it, they didn't need to have the director of the museum there. 
they they wanted it for themselves and uh so i managed to we get my my be able to join them with the backing of as it were having got the museum and then having got an mbe which said hey on this bloke's serious um and so ever since then i've been um involved in that and then it sort of evolved into a thing called uk maritime heritage forum as so, mm -hmm. i mean about a week or so ago i was on and i was representing that's why actually i forgot and i wanted to change this on the bottom of i don't know whether you see des porter museum of knots and sailors rope work it showed up when you when you first popped up all ah, right but it doesn't show now no 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 okay well I, I had to put that up so that they knew who i was although everybody said well i know who you are because of your red hat des but <laughs> that, that was only that was only the people that i knew within the group you know some of which are you know important people at and national museums and it, it meant that I, I was quite prepared to stand up and as it were shoulder to shoulder with the anybody from the National Maritime Museum or Liverpool Maritime Museum or or where the, the, that sort of actually stand and say I'm as equal as you are my museum may be small but you know uh, I, I, and, and so that's it and it was through that organization that I was able to then I was at a gathering at, at the Greenwich National Maritime Museum and a lady who'd recently retired from the um, Science Museum uh, on their maritime side said to me, well, what is your succession plan? And in a way, I shall say to this to you, John, uh, John you know, what's going to happen to your frames when you're not there? You know, so. Well, I'm selling happen? as many as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have three of my own. One I get made for my sister. Yeah. The others I've sold. Good, good man, good man. Because, I mean, and the, good. the goal on that is, I mean, I'm still working on a part-time basis with the company that I've been with for many years, mm -hmm. but as much as I enjoy, and I still enjoy doing that, I work for a large wireless carrier here in the U.S., and and I enjoy doing it, but I'd rather be tying knots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yep, yep, you know, yep. and so the goal is to, at age 66, to get out of that and do this. So... Mm -hmm. What I'm doing with the the videos and the, the YouTube channel sort of took a, it sort of started off. And if you watch the beginning, the first ones, I had really literally one evening, I was like, well, Daryl Inskeep said you should record these and show us how you made a frame because there's no instructions except in Vermont and Hensel, you know, a couple of pages in there. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'll make videos and show people how to do it, what I do. I don't know. I'm just learning myself but I'll show what I'm doing. And it has morphed into a year and four months later into sort of a, a, a force of over a thousand subscribers and 50 countries with people who have a genuine interest in what I'm doing. And so mm -hmm. I thought, well, why not, you know, do what, do this, Skip Hips and said, you know, why don't we do something where we invite people to come in that are not tired. We need to document them because nobody knows about their lives and who they are and what they do. Let's do that. And and then he moved to Arizona and I said, well, I'm just going to do it and um, and have fun with it. And uh, it, it historically documents who we are and gives people a fleshing out of the background of and they're not, you know, how did this guy become a professional knotter and so yeah, on. Yeah. And I mean, it, uh, it, 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 it again is effectively treating this the subject seriously, which is what Absolutely. you're trying to do. Which is absolutely, and that that that's that's always been that you know people think it's a bit of a joke, um, and but then when they say, well, you've managed, how do you make a make, make a living from doing that, or you've got a museum just for that, um, and to a degree, that's part of the problem that I heard you sort of discussing broadly speaking with Lindsay yeah. about trying to get national scale museums to take the matters seriously, and one of the complications, and it, it goes, I mean, it, it it's it's rope or cordage as much as with knots and it's a problem of understanding and then being able to interpret it for the complete novice so um marine archaeologists have really tended to steer clear of cordage because it's much harder to interpret to understand and to treat properly um, they can deal with cannons they can deal with ships timbers because that's 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 more solid it's it, it doesn't quite fall apart in your hands um and they don't and they they well they sort of understand 
it, it's physical there or mm -hmm. you find a sword or a shoe or something there's more of that but with the with, with regards to cordage um and therefore the rigging and so forth it's a lot harder to interpret and it gets in the way um and i can when people come to visit my museum i can talk to them about the subject but if, if you leave it cold just to walk round, how do you explain that this mat made from old rope may have taken 30 40 50 hours for somebody to make yeah. or even longer and make it as, as a, a living uh, sorry make it as a, a gift with a sort of significance taking it home from sea here we are mum here's a or mother it would have been here we are mother here's here's a doormat for you um you know that how how you get that across is is one of the difficulties um with museums and and so it's the interpretation of um the collections which is a, is a is a struggle um that combined with the sort of ignorance of the people in the museum of the whole background because it's not heavily studied heavily documented um you know like what's the earliest knot board do we know you know why were knot boards why were why did people make knot boards when did that what's the earliest one you know um i wrote a piece for knotting matters many years ago sort of a, a little bit about this with i can't remember the facts of, as we speak um but that that's just as an example i mean we talk about hitch bottles um, um a hitch bottle like like this looks quite handsome but if you saw one that had been on, on a grand bank story which i didn't bring from the museum to show i should have done perhaps thinking now we've come to it but the the, the it, it doesn't look very much but it's a lot a lot of work as you know and um yeah. but it, it's quite in a way quite insignificant until you explain what it is and it's a water a water flagon from a from a grand bank story yeah. my father made one when i was a, a kid uh we were down at the beach on vacation and he hitched a bottle uh around a brown cider jug and he explained to me i mean we didn't have plastic bottles then this was the no, no. 1960s and yeah. he said well, this is to keep if it breaks or to keep it from breaking on the boat. Yeah, it's yeah. what the old sailors did. They want they needed something that was secure and that wouldn't be a danger to them if it were to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I mean, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but that kind of interpretation um, and the lack of and so therefore, yeah, anything that one can do. And one of the things that I'm doing with the objects that are going down to um, Chatham is that, I mean, I. I'd started my own cataloging of, of collections in 2000 in a very sort of I, before that I used to just tie a label on something sort of donated by or bought from or you know the, uh, something of that nature and now I'm processing the items going down to Chatham giving them as much information as they need to know but I mean for example I've sent down two um spools or two coils one might say of sword matting hey, 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 hey. now that's in itself is very interesting they didn't understand at all what sword matting was until they had it physically in their hand yeah. neither did they understand when i had a tool which i said was a sword for making sword matting <laughs> you know, in the catalog you see yeah so on those sorts of bases, um, you realize um, that you have to try and give as much knowledge to people who have absolutely no knowledge. I mean, uh, but you see, I even, let's let's see. I mean, the, the coils of sword matting that I sent down were manufactured. They weren't, ma I, uh, uh, and this is the kind, I mean, you can always learn new things and i one day the phone rang and said oh, oh mr forson i understand you do rope work yes yes um i mean do you have some you know, we're looking for some sword matting so i said well yep yeah, yeah how much do you want oh he said about a about a reel of it a coil of it so i went oh oh what what and it transpired this was somebody calling from one of the shipyards in in, in glasgow 
um, and they wanted it to cover the railings on a vessel that they were restoring or working on. And then sort of on closer examination, he said, well, we've got a part reel here, but we haven't got, we don't know where it came from and we can't get any more. It was made industrially. Really? Yes. Not how, made, how, I mean, how many strands, how wide, what material? Well, I, I'm afraid it's, I can't show it to you physically now, okay. but it was, I, I, the two, I had a, I had um, a, piece ah it would be six inches wide six inches wide which would cover a two inch handrail okay sewn underneath so you'd hardly see this the join painted and you would have thought some sailor had spent his entire day <laughs> you know grafting because it would look like grafting then yeah. grafting the whole of the rail interesting and that was in cotton. And then there was a narrower one, which perhaps was that wide, which was made from probably sisal um, that had been treated with some kind of um, brown preservative, okay. cupriol or something like that, or um, uh, creosote or something of that nature. But so I have yet to find who made, you know, what business made them. It, they don't appear in the rope makers catalogues and I've yeah. got a good selection of rope makers catalogues um, that, that they don't offer it for sale. So it must have been a specialist um, narrow weaves, I believe that the, the weaving community, the textile community calls it, but we don't know who made it. Interesting. I, but when we get off of here uh, later today, I will send you a video link to Skip Hips and myself making an ankle loom yep, that yep. he modified for making sword matting that we used for the vast expanses of that large frame for the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And there's a way, I have one, we made one for me, he has one, so that I can produce, I can manufacture maybe 10 or 15 feet at a time. Yeah. Well, you see, in Karls Krona, in the Nash, in the Maritime Museum in Karls Krona, they do have a loom set up for making narrow sword matting, huh. which they would use in much the same way for for chafing gear around perhaps the strops on blocks or on eyes. And at first glance, these and I've got a small block um, that I have um, I bought in an antique shop thinking it was had a grafted cover and it was only when I was looking at it really closely I could see the stitching on the inside I mean we're only talking a small block you know yeah I'm trying to get a good that sort of size of block not smaller it was that sort of size of block mm -hmm. um, and it, it the, the strop was, was, was to my eyes grafted as in Ashley except that it wasn't grafted it was it was a piece of sword matting, narrow sword matting, sewn up on the inside, and that's it. No kidding. So, you know, there is, there is, um, there's still an awful lot for us to find out. And that's one of the sort of um, joys for me, uh, uh, as much as anything, is, is researching, writing about that research. So that's why I write the, mono I publish the monographs. Um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm a man from, from, from the world of books before you know the, the these kinds of devices are sort of very alien in in some ways although the the computer has been an absolute boon for me for writing yeah. um and for publishing my own small works and in a way that's my way of getting the knowledge out and in small chunks doable like your small like a small tutorial it's not a whole it's not a you know three hour um video on, on knots that you do each one in a in a little bit and that bit's done and then you can move on right yeah right but uh no it's uh and so the research side of things has been very much interesting to me um, well, speaking of research mm -hmm. um in conversation with Lindsay, i, I called him up and we chatted i said hey des is going to be on my you know we're not talking and he said make sure to refer or ask him about notes on knots. Well, I was, I readily admit, I was unaware of that. 
and I live 30 minutes from the Mariners Museum. And, uh, you know, I lived, I lived in Newport News for 30 years. Uh, I'm in Williamsburg now, but I'm only, you know, uh, just a, a short drive down there. And I'm a member of the museum. And, uh, I, you know, I want to go to, you know what I want to do? And I want to, you want to let you talk about that in a second. But I, they have the actual volumes, right? They are, yeah, the, yeah. I want to go down there and see if they'll give me permission to take pictures of the volumes. <laughs> well, um, the story of, of the, I mean, just the outside of them. Yeah, yeah. The story of, of, of how that came about um, goes right back to sort of the early days of the Guild. Um, I collect books on knots. And part of my way of making a living from the world of knots and rope work was to sell secondhand, well, new and secondhand books. This is way, you see, before the internet came. I couldn't do it now. I couldn't do it now. But um, one of my customers was Sten Johansson in Stockholm or just outside of Stockholm. Now, you have to understand, I mean, it, it, it's curious, we were talking here sort of 35 years ago, how much the internet has changed the whole approach to the world. But in those days, if you were interested in books and you wanted to know what there was there, you and in the instance of, of the Mariner's Museum, uh, you would write to the Mariner's Museum that you were interested. Could you see a copy of our catalog, please? And they sent me and they sent Sten before a whole piles and piles of photocopies, all, all the cards in their collection that says knots. One of these, and, and Sten would go, got it, got it, got it. Ah, what's this note on knots by Bushby? What's this? Oh, well, um, and he, Sten had a contact in, in America who was in some kind of library and was in a position to be able to contact another library as library to library and say, hey, um, can I have a photocopy of this book? Because Sten would quite happily take a photocopy if he hadn't, couldn't get hold of a new one. There was no kind of internet search system or anything like that for secondhand books. And it could never be done. And we talked about this and he said, well, you know, they, they said, well, it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, and, and he and I agreed that we, we, we'd share the cost, perhaps. Um, but the Newport News were very, you know, woo. And Peter van, the, 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 another contact was Peter van der Green, who probably by that time was in, in, in the Netherlands. But when I first met him, he was fishing out of the Faroes. Um, and he, he would have, you know, rode in with us on this. Um, and I th think he went, yes, he did. He went to Mariner's Museum for, he was in the States for business in some way. And he went and was able to see it. And he took a few photographs of a few pages. And then the, the, the Guild had a meeting, I think, at the Mariner's Museum. And one of the people that was going was Gordon Perry. And I said to Gordon, you know, try and get a look at this notes on knots. It's really pretty important, you know. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he went along and because the meeting was with the museum anyway, at the museum, and they let him see it. He cancelled his, his flight home and stayed an extra two days studying this lot, came back to the UK, said to the Guild, look, look you know, this, this is amazing. Um, and then a little bit later, I was in the States at uh, the Early American Industries Association's uh, gathering at Mystic Seaport. And one of the, there were a couple there, one of them, uh, an English lady who I'd known through the Tall and Trace History Society in the UK. And, um, somebody from uh, uh, Colonial Williamsburg. Oh. They were, and we were going to, and we went down to stay with him uh, at his home. Um, and while he was off, I mean, we, we, we spent a day going around Colonial Williamsburg with him. And then the, the next day I, I had organized and or rather possibly I'm not sure who organized the arrangement, but we, we went to visit the library and we went with this kind of almost, and also from 
colonial Williamsburg kind of thing. So it was yeah. a little bit more formal. And we looked at the things and it was just, you know, mind blowing. And, yeah. it done. and so that's really, I came back and it kind of put more oomph into the, what Gordon had done. I think by that time, Gordon may have died. Um, but, you know, the, the, there was the pressure to get this dealt with. And so the, the guild funded um, or helped fund the, scum, the scanning and everything like that. And uh, then a group of people all over the U, all over the world pulled together to help understand the writing and, and transcribe it so that the thing turns up as a sort of viewable, usable publication. And of course, you know, it way, way predates Ashley. So qu a quick question on that. So those volumes, it's what, six or eight volumes yep. that apparently are bound, were, are they the actual handwritten manuscripts? Yeah, no, 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 yeah no, 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 so no, no. Henry Bush, and, and apparently that wasn't the only thing he did in life. It wasn't like that was his life's work. <clears throat> he was just a brilliant guy who was an observer and document and cataloger of knotting during the course of his life, traveling on ships and seeing other workers who tied knots. And he was fascinated by it among many other things. I can't remember his full life story. It's in the beginning of the, of yeah. the book. And, uh, I just read it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, so there was all of this was his, just his, his notebooks. Yeah. I mean, to a degree, you know, it, it's quite difficult for us to sort of put our, our heads back to a different world when people would keep diaries and journals by hand and everybody did it. You did lots of writing. If you were a sick, if you were a naval officer, one of the skills that you were taught was to be able to draw. So you could draw the outline of, of a headland or whatever like that. So, um, no, it's a, but, but it, it's an amazing piece of work. And I, I know that you refer with, with um, Lindsay that they helped um, the uh, uh, Clifford Ashley with his Ashley Book of Knots. Yeah. Um, whereas the New Bedford Whaling Museum obviously um, was not so interested, although, you know, there is quite a lot of literature one way or another. Um, and uh, I mean, I've, I've collected Ashnealia, as it were, you know, things to do with Clifford Ashley. Um, over the years and uh, um, had the good fortune of meeting his daughter, sadly missed his wife by like a year or six months mm. or something like that. And I actually wrote to Clifford Ashley's widow, but she'd actually died by the time my letter oh. got to her. But uh, I'd been given a connect, um, a, uh, an introductory you know, name to use to speak to her, um, somebody that I'd met in this country. Who, who came from New Bedford or was operating in New Bedford ah. at the time. So, you know, it's a small world and things like that. And it, it's a matter of, it's back to what we're talking about, the maritime curators and about museums. It's, it's, a, it's a focus on a subject for a long time. It's not just, you know, so I mean, not just picking it up from uh, a couple of days and then sort of, or a couple of years, but it's a lifetime of, of knowledge and skills. And in some ways, suspect that COVID has forced you to effectively compress into a, a year. If you had your task, if you were full time working and you didn't have the spare time, it, what you've done um, in, the, in the development of your frames would have taken you, you know, seven or eight or 10 years. Yeah. Because you wouldn't have had the time to really just knuckle down and do it. Yeah. You would have you know, come home at the weekend and you have you've got stuff to do and and I, oh I do do some this afternoon and you put a four or five six hours into it but you can do that so you've compressed as it were a long period of of learning into a short period of time because yeah. of, of the need and as long as you've been stimulated to keep on doing it that's the other side of the coin isn't it it but, is uh, I I um I I just um I don't think I have any mental disabilities that make me obsess on things. I just, but when I find something that I really, really like, I really focus on it. And this is something that in, uh, well, I'm not that old, but I'm 66 years old and I'm at retirement age and I've found something that's a, a passion that I never imagined would have fallen into my lap and I'm running with it. I love it. I would do it if no one else was interested, but it turns out that others are, and we have the internet, and so others get to see it. 
Well, this is, and of course, that was one of the things with founding the guild was actually to bring together people because primarily people were the not tying in the main is a solitary pursuit. You know, you don't, yeah. it's not a community activity as such. Right. I mean, Generally I not, yeah. You can have a, you can have a sort of, a, a, you know, you can have a baggy wrinkle party because you need to get a lot of baggy wrinkle made and yeah. you bring in some beer and you bring in your mates and you say, come on, this is how to do it, all of us, and let's see how who can make it the fastest and we, we need a lot for the ship and that's done. But it's not as such a community, a community activity, but the exchange of ideas is a community mm -hmm. and again prior to the 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 advent of the the internet um you know, the only way that community could could meet would be through through a publication and through meetings i mean face-to-face -face meetings handling right. meetings. right speaking of which um yeah. there's supposed to, we have a scheduled meet in ipswich in the spring true that is correct I I I found the the venue for our very first meeting in in London, and so back in 2019, when somebody put their hands up and said, "By the way, it's only a couple of years, and we'll be be 40 years old. What what's the girl doing about it?" And so I said, "Well, I, I'll organise a meeting in in Ipswich," but it's been a. I mean, I had a venue sorted by the end of 2019. Uh, I had a venue sorted for the the catering. Everything was sorted. Wow. And then, I'm sorry, I was talking about the phone, on the phone to the, the venue, about whether we could organise a Zoom AGM from that, that venue at nine o'clock at night, because it was a council-owned building, and it you know could be tricky, and I w weren't quite sure and what other things we had to do. And she suddenly went, ah, ah, ah. Oh, we had that room was fit for a hundred people. It's downgraded because it's in the inside of a building with not very perfect ventilation. It's down to 42. Huh. <laughs> Back to square one. Really? So, I mean, I had to start from, by, and, and the venue for the catering um, for the Not Tire Supper had shut down and looked as though it was dead. But we have a venue here in Ipswich um, now. Um, it, it'll be a bit cosy because it's not quite as spacious as it might be, but it's got plenty of windows and the, they can put a marquee up in the in the grounds. It's a the uh, local area scouting um, outdoor activity center um, so it's got certain bonuses that if people want to come in their campers or or put a tent up or even there are a number of sort of bunk rooms to just you know dot out on the floor kind of thing near enough there's a few mattresses that sort of thing so I mean it goes back in a way to the early days of the Guild of Not Tires meetings we used to often meet in sea cadet um, uh, venues and you know, I, I've seen 70 year olds sleeping on the floor, you know, <laughs> I mean, so, and that's, and I thought they were old men then. <laughs> Not so old. Well, I'm, I'm 75 and I've just turned 75. So, you know, I'm, uh, it's a, it's a reminder really, but, uh, you know, and that's one of the, the only, that's the, one of the downsides of the, of the, of, of, of the long life of the Guild of Not Tires really is the fact that so many have passed because they were old men. Well, I was 30 something yeah. From yeah. when the group was formed. And those those men that were in their 50s, 60s and, and 70s have long gone. But, uh, yeah. you know, one remembers them well. And yeah. uh, every now and then you go, ah, yes. What about Lester Copesteak? Or what about Frank Harris? Or what about, Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, uh, it kept it kept many people alive. I, mm -hmm. I, mean, I have I, I went to see one of our members in hospital and he was in bed tying knots, giving them away a few days really before he died. That's yeah. wonderful. And, and, and at another meeting, um, one of our members was there 
and he was sort of in the corner and one of my colleagues said do you think he's all right do you think he's do we because we thought he'd just you know gone to sleep at the meeting for keeps he hadn't he wasn't but he'd been bought by his son you know right right towards the end of his life but oh no dennis spud murphy was going to be at our meeting and he was there and the fact that he was kind of like this in the corner and coming back up again but we we looked across the room i can see the the man talking to me and we both looked and we thought he he was a goner you know just past you know just gone to sleep and never woken up but what a way to go in a way so that would be, yeah. break, all, all your buddies and stuff like that and that was very nice so, but you know quite so but i mean i can see it now as i speak to you and it's quite you know in its way quite moving but you know but that was something we gave gave people a real reason to keep on going yeah yeah and so well it's certainly given me a new lease on life it really yeah. has you know yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would play golf or i would I go out and maybe do a little boating. Actually, you know, I had a sailboat. I used to go sailing a lot. But, you know, one of the things in my, that's a focus in my life is what am I doing that's productive, that's meaningful? <laughs> you know, <laughs> trying to do something that, that has some some meaning. And to me, this really, really does. Promoting this as a uh, as an activity, as an avocation, uh, you know, it's important. It's very you- important. You're saying that you're you're managing to sell some of your frames. Are you managing to sell them at a sort of practical commercial way? Because one of the tragedies really is that people, so few people make things that they have no comprehension as to how long anything takes. They have no so, idea. And 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 so they, I mean, I can remember a man saying to me, "How much do you want for that fender?" And I said, oh, that's um, 15 pounds. And he goes, what? 15 pounds for that? So I said, well, no. And that was partly how I managed to, to, to make our living. I said, well, no, if, if you can have some rope, have, have three meters of rope, and that will be you know, six pounds. And then you have, have the book and the tools and you can do the time. You can do it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Right. Oh, huh, that's a different ball game, you know, but um, so I, I mean, I and I was always comfortable with either selling the product or selling the books, tools and materials to make it yourself and, and get the benefit from that. So um, that, that's it. And then people would appreciate the time that they, that goes into something. I'll, t- but, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. So in my search for hard laid line, I was looking for natural line because I want the old sailors look in what I do. That's why. Well, and, so this frame right here. This is the first frame I made. I made it in 14 days and I had no idea what I was doing. I just started doing it and it was like, if I screw it up, it's my, I'm only the one that's gonna see it, but it turned out okay. <laughs> it turned out pretty good. It's kind of, I'll never sell it. It's, it's uh, in a way it's my favorite one. It has some mistakes in it that it's not very cleanly done. It's not glued on properly, but it's the first one. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Now it takes me much longer because I'm videoing every aspect of it <laughs> and I am not on vacation. You know, I'm not on holiday at all. Uh, you know, I mean, so the others like this one, that's, I'm keeping that. That's this art in the middle is my sister's and she's a wonderful artist. And so that was for my wall. I had designed it um, a year and a half ago, at the very beginning of when I started doing this, but what happened when, I, in the, the, let me I digress, Bo, so I was talking to Marty Combs. I emailed him and he said, yeah, I have line, but actually you can get it from Dan now, anyway. And uh, he said, uh, we talked for probably an hour just chatting because we were not tires and we don't know too many people that are not tires to chat with. And so we were having fun talking. And he says, one day he said, I made a knot board, which was a frame. Mm-hmm. It took me six months off and on to make it. And then I hung it over the mantle and my wife, he said, my wife uh, invited some folks over for a party and a guy walked up and looked at it and said, how much you want for that? He said, I wouldn't sell that. And he goes, well, if you were going to sell it, what would you sell it for? He said, Meh, probably a thousand bucks. The guy pulls out a thousand bucks and bought it. And he says, John, I left money on the table. I said, yes, you did. i would never even seen it, but I had no idea. I mean, I just had to imagine, imagine the complexity and Marty's a, a, a wonderful knot tire. 
Um, and so that put a little tickle in the back of my brain. So when I got to making these, I thought, well, if somebody asked me to buy one, you know, and I know what I'm doing now a little bit. I made one. I said, I would sell it for at least a thousand dollars. Well, somebody reached out to me on Facebook after I posted a picture of this one and said, I want one. How much? I said, man, start a thousand bucks. He said, okay, my degree is in economics. And yeah, I think it it's scarcity. It has to be a skill level, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. The scarcity means that you could kind of ask whatever you wanted, really, if they really want it, because they're not going to be able to get it from just somebody willy nilly. No, and, and the only problem that does arise, which Liz and I, I mean, for, for a long time, <laughs> we were making ship's bell ropes for a company here in this country called Nauticalia. And we were making, I mean, I started, they were, they were, well, they were really just a little startup to start. And um, they, they were selling through something called Exchange and Mart, which was a kind of listings um, newspaper kind of thing that came out once a week or fortnight, engraving bosun's calls. And then they got into engraving bells and engraving bells with your ship, your boat or yacht's name on. And we could also, you know, have a bell rope. And so I started and I think my first business with them was trading a few key rings for some uh, a couple of serving uh, serving mallets that they would bought at an auction somewhere. And then he started to buy um, bell ropes in sort of four or five at a time. And then he suddenly had to do a bigger bell for a project. And so I made him a bigger bell rope, but commercially orientated because it's it wasn't the first time I'd made bell ropes commercially. Um, for a yacht chandlers um, but the business grew as they grew so we grew and then they started to find that there were others who were getting things made out in India or China mm -hmm. and of course, considerably cheaper considerably cheaper and I've always had to say to people I don't work for a bowl, bowl of rice uh -uh. and you know that's the difference and um, so for example, fenders, um, the the um, where was it? The east coast, the southeast coast of of, um, of India, Kerala, and that area, they make the koya and they make the fenders there now, and they're made for a bowl of rice, basically. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to make a living as a fender maker, you have to do custom work, special work, not bulk work, and it has to be, you know. But even then, the your price might be twice the price of an Indian one. Yeah. When it really ought to be four times the price of an Indian one. Right. But people can't get their head around paying four times for something almost the same as an Indian one. Yeah. The only reason that I have commanded the price that I have, and I, I may not put all this in, I you know, I feel nervous a little bit or about what talking I get money, for these. Because I mean I I'm getting twenty five hundred and three thousand dollars for my work now. Well, that's grand, and that's which is wonderful. But in a, and I'll tell you one way. I, I like Dan Noel, who is a, an active duty bosun's mate in the Coast Guard. Is he's my supplier of my life, yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. A, a very nice guy. And uh, we've become good friends over the phone. I've never met him face to face, but um, he was going to the birthday of the Coast Guard at a place in Michigan. They I think they have it there every year. And he said, send me a frame. I'll sell it for you. I said, ah, which one do I want to sell? So it was, a, I think, the most recent one I'd made at the time. I said, I'll, I'll ship it to you. And I said, here's my deal. I want 2500 bucks for it. Whatever you sell it for, the rest is yours. Mm -hmm. Well, he sold it for 2500 <laughs> I was like, come on, man. I'm trying to help out the young guy who just, you know, who's the enlisted man. But, I mean, it, it all worked out fine. But he should have offered it 3500 he should have. The first lady that walked up and said, that is amazing. How much? And he goes, well, the artist wants 2500 She goes, I'll take it. That's a great price. I'm like, come on, man. You <laughs> priced it so that he could make a buck. I did. <laughs> I did. So anyway, it, it all worked out. But um, but in fact, they're worth that. They are. Yeah, I mean, and I, you've got, and equally, you have to understand that if you were selling it through a gallery, the gallery's got to take a cut. Everybody, I mean, there are lots of people that have got no idea about business. I mean, I'm afraid that this applies 
to sort of many civil servants and things like that. They can do a budget for their bit for their work, but they don't understand about making profit. Yeah, it's important and, if you if if you want it, to sustain what you do. And if you don't make a profit, you finish up by making a loss. If you give it away, people have no idea what the cost might be. Yeah. Well, and it, it, the crazy thing to me on this, obviously, they require a tremendous amount of work. I think that one took two and a half months of, you know, not continuous, and the number of hours, it's about 45 hours of work, maybe 50 hours of work. Um, and the materials are inconsequential cost wise. I mean, it's made maybe, maybe 100 to 150 dollars worth of materials, if that. Well, um, but I mean, for that, people it, wouldn't appreciate, you know, 150 dollars for the materials. Yeah, uh, 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 what people don't understand. What's crazy is that, and and it, this is uh, luck of the draw. I don't know. It appears that my design ideas that I like, others like, and so then people immediately started saying, "Oh, you're an artist." And I'm like, "Huh? Uh, I guess, yeah." <laughs> I don't oh, that, know. that then kind of there is sometimes a different appreciation between an artist and a a craftsman. Yeah, you know, a craftsman's just a workman. If you understand what I mean, just a laborer. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think um, uh, I can't remember whether we used to say on our Chris on our, our business cards. Um, I think we said craftsmen's in rope twines and cords. Yeah, because that's what we consider ourselves to be craftsmen. But the appreciation of craft is 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 not that high in the world in some ways. But uh, should be. But, but you're right. A lot of these bottles that are here, um, these are all kind of, um, they're locked out, they're my lockdown project, you see. Beautiful. So um, that's a, a cider flagon. Um, Love it. Using up the materials. Um, and what's been very nice for me is that uh, I've sold a, a couple or three um, at reasonable sort of money, not, not <laughs> big by a long way. Yeah, yeah. I've also been in a position that I have had, there's a couple of three artists who have been very generous with their work. So somebody always sends me, and when I talk about, um, it won't mean, well, uh, th that he's represented by a West End gallery in London and his catalogue is sort of like 15, 20 quid a catalogue, you know, and it, I, I'm on his mailing list. That's my bird. Uh -huh. Matter of fact, I'm gonna, he he has decided we've been chatting too long. Uh -huh. I'm just going to let him out. Give me a second. What's his name or her his, name? His name is Addison, and uh, he Addison. is a Congo African gray and with a red tail there. He's okay. quite a, he's my little friend. I've had, he's he's a 24-year-old bird. Really? Yeah, and he'll outlive me, God willing, you know, well, unless I live to be 110, so... Uh, very long life. Very long life. I'm going to put him back where he can, where he, where he can not get into trouble. But he's less likely to squawk and peep and talk if he's sitting outside. Oh yes, yes. Love it. That is beautiful. Into the Merchant Navy, 1999. Into an era, not bored. Yeah. See, Ber Bernard was in the Merchant Navy. Was he? Yes, yes. And so he's, a lot of them were that kind of uh, way. And this one, he made this one in 2001. All right. Not long, not long before he died, really, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, you know, and Jeff Wyatt has made some beautiful frames. I, I think, think Jeff was. sort of just made the announcement that he's not making frames anymore. And his wife, uh, of course, he was framing his wife's wonderful wood burning. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, biography. Yes, indeed. Amazing, amazing. I'm going to say that that was. I mean, you were talking about uh, Jeff Wyatt's uh, frames, and um, effectively there was a kind of, I can do that. Oh, I can do better than that. And there was, I'm not, you know, friendly kind of inspiration and competition. Liz has done a lot of frames, um, and she does smaller scale mirrors, round mirrors with yeah. frame uh, and, and things. Um, and, you know, so people would feed off one another's ideas and, oh, I could do better than that. And you know, again, this is you know, before 
such things as, as the only way you do it would be able to take it to a meeting and somebody will look at it, really. Yeah. And, and so this really um, is, if you like to say, the, so, I mean, yeah, Jeff's work would have been inspired. I mean, Bernard, he, he was a good friend of Bernard's um, and Bernard, Bernard was probably the first person that did much in the way of sort of bought these frames. I'm trying to think now who else did them, but you know, the same really with the hitch bottles and things people would, yeah. would you know, and oh, and not, and not so much, you know, I can do better than you, Yahoo, but it was, you know, oh, I like the look of that. Let me have a go at doing it. Oh, how did you do the outside of that? So, I mean, Bernard, Bernard's circular frame uh -huh. has got this continuous um, uh, star knot. Uh, it's a, con a complete star knot all the way around. The yeah. single strand star knot senate for want of a better word, but it is a continuous Turk's head, really, I think. I don't think there's a join in it. No, I don't believe there's a join in it. It's done, and certainly Liz does her circular frames in that sort of way. Really? Um, without a join. So you make it up as in, Stuart Granger describes how to do it, um, to turn it into a sort of, into a star knot um, situation. Uh, That's awesome. Is, and then so the the, the 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 outside has no join. So that's, that's you know, amazing. You don't have any you don't have any mitres to cover or anything like that. Right, right. But, I mean so um obviously I mean I think that there's joins underneath here. Yeah. But uh but uh, see Bernard Bernard was with the Royal Mail line his entire or virtually his entire Marath um, you know, na uh, merchant navy career. Yeah. So I mean, he, the merchant navy vessels um, featured quite heavily in his work. So that, that's it. I mean, that would go down to Chatham, which is you know, cool. Good. It be 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 there. Um, and g going back in in its way, talking about museums and about the access of material and and about the interpretation of the materials. I mean, and um, Newport News must have um, plenty of rope work. It's a matter of them sort of highlighting it and making something of it. And it may be that that is a way in which the guild or or um, such could help them. And I, I'm sure that the um, bursary that, the, that the, 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 the guild have and, and also that sort of money, we are quite up for, um, how can I say, to, to, to helping out, you know, somewhere like Newport News doing something. So it, it, it could, sometimes they go, oh, well, we can't afford to do that or whatever. Um, and, and no, you know, maybe we can help because we do have funds that can do that sort of thing, perhaps. I would but love it, if they would do something. I mean, I need to get down permanent. there. I think a permanent display that rep represents Nodding, which I mean, and, and, and rope and not in the use of it in the maritime trade, it was huge, it wouldn't exist. Yep, but what I mean, but it's the same with all the museums. And I say it's about that problem is interpretation. One, secondly, it's it's about communicating. They feel that you know there aren't enough people going to be interested, and of course, that's the chicken and the egg until you can get show it to people and interpret it. And it is this interpretation mm -hmm. that is part of the, the, the issue. Um, and that uh, um, museums have had a tendency to reduce the amount of uh, materials on display because there was a whole era of, of that was the curation aspect. You know, don't put too much out because it will confuse, confuse the people. Um, I think that that aspect of a museum display is slowly falling out of favor now. But uh, um, the other thing, John, though, is almost just to build a relationship with the museum um, and ask to view their reserve collection. That's my goal. And I think, and if you approach them with that question that you are what you are um, and that could you please, you know, view their reserve collection of, of rope work. And I have a feeling something in the back of my mind tells me that they might even have Ashley, some of Ashley's um, original um, 
paperwork or drafts or something. I don't quite know. Really? I, can't, I can't be sure about that. I may be confusing it, but I think they do have some either his or Cyrus Day's. They've got they've got some kind of other, you know, in their archives, but they hardly knew. You see, that that one of the problems with Bushby, going back to the the um uh, notes on gods, yeah, um, is that uh it was catalogued as a book. But I think it was in their um, in their um, manuscript uh, collection. Uh -huh. So it wasn't on the shelf. Right. It wasn't in the shelf in the reserve store of the library. It was in their in their manuscripts area. Uh -huh. So I think that might be. I'm not sure if it's Ashley or Cyrus Day that they've got some paperwork. Um, I seem to remember. It's a while ago, whether my wife will remember or not, whether Liz will remember. Uh, uh, so you, you actually live in in um, in, in um, Williamsburg itself? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I could walk to the colonial area. Well, it's I'm four miles from the colonial area where you know, the college and Duke of Gloucester Street and so forth. And I go down there. If you watch some of my other videos, if you get, get some time on your hands to do that, I try to do introductions where it's not boring just hi i'm john here i'm tying knots uh i've walked through the colonial area a number of times and we'll try to introduce this or that or the other the la the most recent one that i did with Lindsay, i went down of course it's nearby to the jamestown historic area so i went down there and walked around it's a fascinating area to live in you have for sale for, for a very nominal fee for uh, the um what do you call them the, the uh, monographs the monographs yes 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 i mean the oh, those are certainly readily available that's great that's good but, good but i mean and that and there is a lesson there as far as publications is concerned that i would like to share with people which i learned from uh a, an amazing craftsman and researcher in the north of australia um ron edwards I don't know if you've come across his name. Ron Edwards is a, was a number of things, but a leather braider, um, a make, whip maker, and an artist, uh, and recorder of, of songs and all kinds of things in, nor in North, um, North uh, Queensland, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramskull Press was his press. Okay, yes, I've seen Ramskull Press stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well. The, the the lesson I learned from him, and I, it was a joy, again, you see the internet didn't exist. I would sell his books in the UK. I'd pick up the phone at sort of six o'clock in the morning and get him just as he was finishing work in the evening. And we discussed what I was having for dinner, um, what I was having for breakfast and what he was having for dinner. Um, amongst <laughs> other things. And it was always a joy. Um, and, um, but he published many of his works in slim volumes and then over you know five years he'd have you know six slim volumes that would then make a thick volume right and it's a doable thing so as i say it's back to a bit like you doing a tutorial on making somebody doing a tutorial on making a star and then another time about how you might make your um your your uh, sword matting or whatever so the, the little bits that are doable if if you had to make the whole thing so that's the the beauty of the monographs and equally so many people when you're doing research work say oh yes but there's still more knowledge to come there's still information oh it's out of date already i've just published a, a book and had you know 500 printed and now and now i've got more information well i print these at the very 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 most i've only ever done a hundred but most of the time they're done in 30s or 50s and the thinner volumes i print literally to order and they are then up to date when more information comes uh -huh. to light 
You That's can smart. Put it all. So, I mean, these are my working copies with little notes to tell me that I need to add a, another maker for the small pricker that I found in the collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sound maker's needles, there's a lot more information and I suddenly realised I hadn't explained anything about packing needles, which people think are sound maker's needles, um, and so on. So um, that, that's how they've come about. I mean, the sound maker's palms. Yeah. That, that was a 60 page book. Wow. And now it's 110. Huh. People, different people learn different ways. Um, some want to watch a video or see somebody in person, kind of not. Um, I've mostly learned from books and from, and lately from YouTube uh, tutorials, but the importance of all the different books that different people have produced is that people learn different ways. And someone, I, I like having a paper book that I can sit and, and pour over and look at and, and, uh, and, you know, study, truly study it. And um, so, but it's important that we have a diverse means of disseminating this important information. So, and, and for myself, of course, there was no such thing as videos or anything like that. And where I grew up, though, I wasn't surrounded by, by seafaring folk or anything like that. I grew up in land, I, I was involved in the scouts, and there were a few knots in scouting books, but I had to teach myself to tie from not from books mm -hmm. and effectively i learned to read the pictures um you're asking if there's other things we could talk for days i'm hoping um that there we have a physical meet for the igkt sometime that i can get to it if i have to fly to the uk that's good i can do it um i'll make arrangements to be able to do so but you know this whole COVID 19 thing has you know yeah it's insane um you know, really I, mean, know. I mean it, it's uh it's changed our world it most certainly has you know changed the world and uh, semi-permanently yeah, yeah yeah indeed i'll just show you just uh, this is the sort of thing that i find quite exciting and yet really and it kind of uh, what's the right word? And I haven't written this up yet. I'm supposed to, I want to try and write it up for Notting Matters at some stage or another to explain it. But you're, you're quite familiar with a sea chest with a cleat on it and a, a, a grubbit. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you'll appreciate that sea chests are not the only chests that have rope handles to them, but that cabinet makers um, or, 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 or woodworkers have tall chests with rope handles on it. Okay. So you would see my hand is the cleat, and that's right. what you see. Okay. Well, I was approached by somebody who said, well, my cleat is broken. The, the rope is broken. Can you make me a new cleat? Can you make me a new grommet? Or right. a new handle, rather. He said right. a new handle. So I said, yes. He took the cleat, the wooden part off, and that was what was underneath ah interesting and how old is that we don't know exactly right uh, gosh you've now reminded me that i don't know but that's that's see now that's you know you see you've seen probably pictures on the internet of uh and i don't know who posted this but it's a picture of a knot tied to hold a door closed from egypt from back in the oh, yeah, 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 interesting yeah, yeah. To, to look at that. So, I mean, yeah. th that type of thing that you're showing me there. Now, yeah. that was what is underneath it. The cleat is over the top of that, huh. has a carved out place for it. It is, in fact, not a grommet, it's just a piece of rope with a sm simple knot settled and buried. Yeah. So, that's not the way that a sailor would do it. No. That's not come from, I mean, a sailor wouldn't do that. But the man who's a woodworker knows I know I can tie a knot and I can put my piece of wood, I'll carve out a hole in my piece of wood and I can put it inside. And so I then made a, I made a dummy to see how it comes and what it yeah. looks like. And I've managed to you know, replicate it precisely. Yeah. 
And so I must have, it, it's waiting so here. Say, you're right, a sailor would never have done that. So, so, it, 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 it would have been a grommet, but it, interestingly enough, that if it's just a grommet, when you lift the chest, the chest can wobble. So yeah. you've got to have Turk's heads either side of the grommet to stop it moving. And most of the simple grommets on chests and lots of sea chests have just a simple grommet, uh, just a simple grommet, sometimes covered with um, covered with uh, um, shirting or something and then wormed over the top of it, a little bit of leather and a couple of Turk's heads and that's it over the cleat. But uh, this uh, was such a, an interesting thing to learn about. So I was able to, I mean, I actually made the man, he wanted something a little bit fancier. So I made him a proper pair with uh, grommets and, and leather and, and Turk's heads, you know, pink leather and Turk's heads and so forth, but uh, oh. wormed up and, and made it look, because that's what he wanted. But actually it, it, the lesson that I, I gained was, was how it would, was done um, originally sort of yeah thing. So, yeah so well, speaking I mean, of it looked, you could have replaced it you could have replaced it with a piece of piece of right anyway uh, i made a grommet even in situ without taking the cleat off if you needed to but yeah. there we are so lessons can be learned and there's always little bits and pieces to pick up and that's what i find very interesting yeah. so it's not necessarily the fancy things because that's just a little open of a Ooh. opening of a door but a practical thing um, yeah, yeah, right. uh, Jim reached out to me a couple of weeks ago, Jim Wolf, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and said you should submit an article to Notting Matters about the the big frame that Skip Hips and you made, you know, that, that Skip Hips and I made that's, that's currently residing in the Chief of Naval Operations office behind his desk. So I haven't gotten to that yet. I just yeah, I know. Mean, even your the, the sort of way that you built your frames up to give them some different layers. Um, I mean, I know that when Liz and I were doing them, or Liz was doing the rope work, and I was um, making sure we got the frames. Up, we we had you know fun and games trying to find mouldings at, at, at the picture mounting, you know, picture frame. Yeah, yeah. Level, the right kind of mouldings that would give some texture to the surface, and I mean. That's what you know. You you were making your own frames with those layers and so forth. I'll show you some. I was struggling cutting miter corners. Well, no yeah. one's going to see it. It's going to be exactly. covered in knots. Yeah, yeah, so, indeed. So yeah. this is the current commission that I have for okay. a customer out on the west coast. Um, I just cut them square. Yeah, but it was fine. And then I didn't want it to warp at all. And I wanted to make a nice recess here. So I simply cut these boards more narrowly than this to make my accommodation for the eight by 10 picture that he's going to put in there and yeah, glued yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah. It'll work perfect. That. And then I'm going to be putting Luan on here so that it is tiered because this is going to be Russian in here yep. and then four, three other layers of, of Senate, but it will be tiered up a little bit. With, with, with some wood. Yes, with Luan. Um, uh, I guess quarter inch Luan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Easy to do. But uh, equally, you know, it's a, it, it can open somebody's mind and say, oh, oh, I could have done it that way. Oh, why didn't I think about it? You know, because, you know, the proper way of doing a picture frame has got to have the mitres. But you don't have to have the mitres. And in fact, the way you've done that, yeah. The one so it's it's two pieces of wood so effectively yes. yeah they they're making your you haven't even had to cut tenons on it really not at all didn't have to use a router and cut out I just made that I ripped it on a table saw one board narrower than the other to exactly accommodate the size that I needed it to be yeah. and uh, I did it in an afternoon even with setting the saw up and taking it back apart I mean you know set covering it back up and all yeah, yeah. So, Weather permitting, I have to, I, I don't have a wood shop and a workshop. I have, what I'm sitting in right at this moment used to be a dining room. I mean, this is a townhouse. It's not a big place, but it's perfect for my needs. But I was like, yeah, you know, I'll pull the chandelier out and put up an LED light and have a work table built. And then I built a, some shelves to accommodate my, my supplies. And I built a deck right at the beginning of COVID 
and that's a nice big 16 foot by 16 foot deck and I have a table saw out there and a chair to sit in and relax in and it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's working so far. Well, that's good. That's good. Well, I, I, I hope that you can um, find a good way to get into the Mariners Museum um, and, and sort of approach them in a gentle sort of way, um, but that, that, that's there. Um, and, you know, if there is some interest, I'm sure that uh, the trustees of the International Guild of Knot Tires would be, because um, they certainly put money their way for the Bushby. We put quite a bit of money into that. I mean, uh, you know, thousands of dollars um, went into the work that we, you know, to, to it as well as our own work, you know, as, uh, uh, um, contribution in time, but also um, actual physical money for, you know, them to pay commission, I think, to have it all scanned in the first instance. Really? Uh, and there may be some other things there. As I say, I am not can't remember whether they've got some original Ashley or it's original uh, Cyrus Day, but they, they, yeah. they both have. Yeah. The thing is that I, I know the way I've always approached it is that I'm interested and in that well, I'd like to look at some of the rope work in your reserve collection. I mean, I think it's it's using the terminology. You see, reserve collection okay. is, what, is what they've got. It's their collection, but it's the it's their reserve collection. Let me write that down. Yeah. And the it reserve does reserve collection. Depend. Yeah. That's what you want to view. Yeah. But, I'm not and it depends. I mean, Liz and I have had all kinds of different um, reactions. Yeah. One of the things is they say, well, what do you want to look at? And you say, I want to look at rope work uh, or knots or something. And they put that into their database and then now get you out just about three items. <laughs> and, I mean, I did this at, at Mystic many years ago. Yeah. And, and they, well, it wasn't three. There was a table full of stuff. But I said, well, what about this, the, the ditty bags? Oh, I said, do you have any rope mats? Ah. What about and it, if the word not hadn't wasn't in the search term and in that in that instance at the at, at Mystic, the, the guy there, Dave Matheson at the time, um, said, oh, well, come with me. And we just went down in the stores and pulled the drawers out. Look at that. Look at this. All yeah. sorts, of, sorts of things. We went to another museum and made the arrangement and the uh, the curator was brilliant and everything came out this was at new bedford in fact and all sorts okay. of stuff that ashley had drawn for the ashley book of knots you know that th was in their collection and i could say oh yes that is that's his drawing number 224 or whatever yeah uh, that was very good and then i went to another museum that's now closed near there kendall um and the lady was very apologetic the curator was very apologetic um, that she had to go to another meeting and she would leave me with this intern. And of course he played it by the book. So I had to sit outside and look down their catalog and say, can I see this? And he said, right. And he went out the back and he bought, here we are, Mr. Pawson, here we are. Yes. So thank you very much and looked at it. Thank you. I'll take it back. Uh, can I have a look at this? Yes, Mr. Pawson, I, I will go and get you, you know, uh, but instead of letting me have a wander around, yeah, I mean at the Peabody we did the same, and they had some amazing rope rope shoes. Wow! Know? And so, can we have a look at these? Can we learn about these shoes? What do you know about it? And off they go. But they wouldn't have known that I was going to be interested in these shoes. I just saw them on the rack. Oh, that looks interesting. What do you know about these? And they then looked up where they'd come from and everything like that. And. Uh, right from somewhere in New York and you know but uh, so you never know who you get but if if they begin to realize that you know what you're looking at um that sort of does help yeah so that's why I'm saying that you 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 believe that they've got some work from Clifford Ashley I think I, I said so, well I know that at, at one time there was some sort of an anniversary or something but I was down there and as soon as you walked in the door of course, it's all different now. They've all rearranged it since they have the monitor, <clears throat> the USS Monitor uh, exhibit, which is takes up a large, it's a whole new wing. But there was a little room that was dedicated to Clifford Ashley, the Ashley Book of Knots, and had several of his paintings. And they, uh, what sticks in my mind, because this is probably 20 years ago, but what sticks in my mind that they had a write-up in there stating that they had purchased paintings um, 
to help financially support his efforts and they knew what he was doing in that endeavor to to uh produce the, the Ashley Book of Knots and they helped him you know they they bought some and he was a good artist he, he, he uh, did some nice paintings there was also a special printing of the Ashley Book of Knots with their name at the front with what with that with that imprint in it oh really yeah yeah there was so um that i don't know how many of them were printed but mm -hmm. there was a number of them printed with um their details at the front of it i i can't tell you now without finding i think i've got a scan or a photocopy or something of it um but there was that the, the, apart from the um original publishers um that there were some that had this on it i mean i I've got a signed Ashley here, um, but it's not it's not a, a new it's not the Mariners Mariners Museum one. Yeah, um, but the, the, I think they there was a you know very possibly there might have only been sort of a, a, a couple of dozen done or something like that. But okay. uh, with with a with a flight with a sheet in it that had the Mariners Museum um, detailing in it. I, I'm I, sure I they would on. know. <laughs> yeah, well, they, yeah, someone, yeah, there, yeah. someone there should know. Indeed, but I, I say it might, it might, that might sort of show that you know a bit more than than the man in the street, because that's the whole point. Because they can't cope with, you know, I mean, some museums won't see anybody anyway. But yeah. you know, there is, a, it's a matter of approach. But it just, it might be worth doing that, and then you can perhaps build on it. You can perhaps yeah. build. That, that yeah, and I, I just day. joined. I just spent uh, a small amount of money just to join, to be a member of the museum, gives me free yeah. access and, and, and a yeah. guest for cheap and so on. So I'm going to just kind of sidle up to him softly and see what I can do to become friends with some people there. I have a friend who works there. I need to reach out to her. I haven't talked to her in years, but uh, I know through another association, but I ought to reach out to her and see if she can point me in the right direction or introduce The curator that would cover that field. I mean, it's. I think you'll find it's in the in the in the, the manuscripts rather than the library as such. Yeah. But I, I mean, and I think certainly that was the problem with with the Bushby thing. And you know, who knows if you see something interesting, you know, maybe there's some another partnership worth pursuing. Never know. Well, there you go. Um, I think we probably nearly um called ourselves enough for a while. And uh, yeah, it's um, almost time. It's almost time for you to go to bed there. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know a couple of hours yet for dinner, but yeah. it's dark as hell out there now. It wouldn't have done us any good at all if we had um, not had some, uh, uh, yeah, if we had uh, uh, not turned the lights on to start with. We, we'd be talking in the dark now. I'd yeah, I see. Good. I've watched the light go down in your, your window there, or your door back there. Yeah, that's the, the door. Top. That door at the back there goes into what was a conservatory, but is my woodworking workshop and where right. we keep the bikes and then through there into the house oh yeah you know, um, before i forget i did there's this so the museum is mostly moving to where is it going chatham historic dockyard okay and chatham has chatham has a um a working rope walk that mechanically you know proper long they they will say that their rope walk building is a quarter of a mile long but oh, it's, wow close to that sort of size um and the the collection is going there uh it's being as as it when it arrives it gets and this is the sort of thing that people the general public are not aware of what happens anything that is um uh non-metallic so any any uh, vegetable matter of any sort any organic matter that's the word organic matter when it arrives it goes into a freezer and depending on which freezer it goes into, it's either in the freezer for th three or four days or in for a fortnight in the freezer. That's the first thing that happens to the stuff when it gets there. It's then inspected and um, I've already catalogued it in a catalog and described it as best I can. The, then one of their volunteers brushes it down clean and with special it's a special way of marking um, objects. So you put a layer of um, cellulose and then you write, and then you put another layer of cellulose over the top so that there's a permanent um, but removable um, markings. And then they are photographed and ultimately 
the theory will be that the whole collection will be viewable through you know online okay all right uh, and but you'll have to hunt for it and they don't have much on at the moment um meanwhile they are now having a new gallery and to celebrate rope okay because they realize that actually their major selling point is the ropery the operating ropery although i mean there are plenty of historic dockyards portsmouth in this country but charles Croner um and uh other naval bases uh Char charlestown and things historic dockyards but there's none of them with an operating rope walk in it. So they realize that that's important to, to interpret. They had to sort of change their um, collecting policy to incorporate our collection because up until then, they only collected things that related to Chatham historic, uh, the Chatham dockyard. And it was a naval dockyard and built, I mean, the Victory was built there uh -huh. uh, and, and so forth. Um, the Victory was built there, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, I, I'll stand to be corrected on that, but she, she certainly <laughs> passed through um, there. But you know, many vessels were built there. Do you know I mean so? And the curator there is a maritime man. Good. He just joined. He's just joined, and he was at Greenwich. Then it, the Royal, the Royal, uh, the Museum of the Royal Navy in Portsmouth, and now he's there. And a couple of days after he came up to see me, he was sailing on the Swedish. East Indiaman, um, replica East Indiaman from Stockholm to Gothenburg, and obviously, so that's what he did on his day off, as it were. Yeah. So that tells you that he's a good guy. So I'm yeah. much, I'm much, uh, much happier uh, with him at the helm, looking after and putting together the collection and the displays and things, than somebody that was just sort of um, had got no feel for the matter. So I'm very happy for that. Right. So the, when we were first starting the guild, we tried to get sort of some of the rope companies to advertise in, yeah. in matters and things like that to help sort of fund that. And uh, really, we don't spend enough money. I mean, when, when I got my MBE for services to the rope industry, which was how it was um, gazetteered, um, was the way that they found that they could do it. Uh, they would obviously never given anything to the rope industry for a long time. And the fact that it was really the, the 20th anniversary of the Guild of Knot Tires, um, the 25th anniversary of the Guild of Knot Tires, that were, it was done because, um, but uh, um, I, I, I could hear in my head people at some of the rope supplier, what well, Des Porson, he never buys enough bloody rope to... <laughs> Uh, services to the rope industry he hasn't made us rich um, <laughs> but, uh, but no i mean the 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 mba really is is actually the guild's mba as much as my mba um because the the whole premise of the mba is that they pick ordinary people that kind or sort of semi-ordinary people shall we say at least that represented uh, uh, a group of people so that's often why, you know, somebody in the Red Cross or, you know, um, uh, in a local um, um, self-help group or, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. somebody that's given a lot to society in one way or another. But it's, 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 it's also representing the, the very originals at the end of the Second World War. Effectively, it was to represent the, the, the people that worked in the factories and the munitions and things like that rather than we're on the front line so right. it's a kind of it, it, it they couldn't reward everybody but they rewarded sort of um one might say token people from within the organizer within the se sector right. so that hence that it was for, for my services to the the the, the rope industry but yeah. uh, i say and that's what they consider the guild of knot tires must have been servicing the 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 the, the rope industry so yeah I mean, that was, that was sort of the, the story behind that. But uh, yeah. Well, and, and, but before I forget this, and we'll get off of here in a second, I know you need to get on with life. Um, I'm talking about monetizing things. When I first started doing these videos on tutorials on how to do frames, a number of my friends, uh, both close and far away said, why are you doing that? You're creating your own competition. I said, you have no idea what you're talking about in this regard. Most people, if they're going to make one of these, it's a bucket list. And after they make that one, they're like, never again, because they're a pain and they take a long time to do. So 
the likelihood of somebody being as passionate about making them as I am and competing with me is remote. Well, exactly. That's why I published my uh, book, uh, Dead Sportsman's Not Craft and Rope Mat, or previously just Dead Sportsman's Not Craft, the one exactly. The reason I published that was to share my knowledge. And if somebody can make a living by the knowledge that I have gained, um, good for them, because you ain't going to get your Rolls Royce from doing it. No. I mean, your, your hourly rate, it, it, however much money you're getting for, for your frames, your hourly rate is, if you wanted to charge it out at, at even the minimum rate, I mean, you were just talking about spending an afternoon making the frame. Yeah. If you had to have the plumber in to do some plumbing work for the afternoon, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, or, exactly. Or even, or even just the, the carpenter come in to put a new new door in or something, you know? And so, it, you know, if it, that's been my feeling if you can make a living um good on you i'm sharing the knowledge that i've picked up from others along the line um they're my trade secrets i don't have an apprentice but that's the nearest i get it's wonderful um, very pleased to do that. all right master all the best goodbye from ipswich i catch you we'll talk to you again good. soon okay good man bye now okay. cheers then <laughs> Well, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed the conversation that I had with Dess. Uh, a real delight and uh, very informative. And I don't know who's coming up next, but we'll find another knot tire out there and do another We're Not Talking. Thanks so much for watching, and have a happy holiday. <laughs>